the tradition of the narrow boat with its roses and castles and its boating families, the Wallingtons and the Hambridges, the Lowe's and the Tollies. I'm on the back of my tiller at a weekend or if I've got a week off I just feel completely relaxed and I just feel in tune with 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 her I call her a girl, although I, I don't suppose Tench is a, really a girly name, it's obviously a fish, so she is a Joshua fish class, but she just looked beautiful to me. She was built in 1936, so she had a birthday on the uh, 14th of July, so last week. So it's just amazing that you, I've got something that's so old and, and uh, valuable in, in terms of not money, but in history. I wanted a proper speed wheel, I wanted proper gears, I wanted to experience what it was like. out in the fresh glowing colours of self-taught artists. Barges proud of their ownership and the pride of their crew. Fancy rope work, rows and castle designs on panellings sparkling like kingfishers over the water. Even a bucket's a thing of beauty. show that Kate Safin and I are doing is called Idle Women of the Wartime Waterways. Now Idle Women is the term that was used for the women who got involved in a training scheme to operate canal boats during the Second World War to carry cargo. Um, they were nicknamed Idle Women later, after the war, but it's a, it's a really good name for a show so we thought we would use it. The journey that the women took was from London up to Birmingham with cargo which they deposited at Tisley and then they went across to Coventry with an empty boat to pick up coal to take back to London. I had what well, I always describe as a brilliant idea but one so obvious I cannot understand why I didn't think of it before. The women followed a route. It was a tour. They gave it to us well on a pair of boats really, <laughs> less than a plate. So then the next thing was we decided we should really do this with a historic boat. Not only do we get um, a woman who was prepared to loan us her working boat, but we could have it for the entire 15 week tour. People say we never have one foot on one boat and the other foot on another. <laughs> never do it, so we always do it. <laughs> So as far as I'm aware, um, I'm the first um, female owner of Tench and Skipper. Um, I've not seen anything in the history that's been passed down to me that there's been a previous female Skipper. So I suppose that in itself is, is a real sort of pleasure. The progress of the barges may be slow, but uh, who would want to hurry through such lovely English countryside? 
the chug-chug of the barge has become as familiar as the notes of the cuckoo. She was restored in the 70s and she actually carried in, in the uh, first cargo um, after being restored in 1978 and she carried until I think it was about 1985 in the West Midlands and uh, Tench did work during the war. We're still hearing stories coming out of the war about things that, that particularly women did that they didn't talk about much. Either because it was considered quite secret at the time, like working at Bletchley Park, or because they just felt they were getting on and doing their bit. Not called up yet? They won't take him, he's a transport worker. They took my bill and he was a transport worker. There are 3,825 miles of inland waterways in Great Britain. Full use of canals might well relieve rail and road congestion. A call to action, and this means you. There are about a hundred girls on the estate, and they come from all walks of life. Typists, hairdressers... They've come to learn how to make speedboats. The girls prove that they can handle a blowtorch as easily as a cigarette lighter. The refueling of planes is but one of the duties which the WAFs are capably handling. And the girls can handle the spade with the best. Hats off then, lads, to the girls of the British backwoods. They're doing some grand work on the home front. Women are taking to shipbuilding, like the ships they help to build take to water. There are proud to be adventures on the way, and the girls are responsible for seeing that 50 tons of essential war supply get safely through to their destination. I moved on to a boat in 1999, this boat. At the time, I always thought one day I'd have a different boat, but somehow I've never moved on because she's a lovely boat. I came across the stories of the trainees and the books they'd written quite early on and read them all. So I had in mind to, that I wanted to write uh, a play and, and, and share this story. The beginning of it just began to, th began to write itself in my head, the notion of, um, a daughter finding her mother's diary. I wish I could do something more useful than tea and knitting. Mummy and Hugh seem to think my war work is to produce babies, and that not producing one is positively unpatriotic. moments in doing the research, which involved reading all of the books, or four of the books, I also found some contemporary newsroom. And the first piece I found was called Beauty and the Barge. In my young days, there was one job no girl would have touched with a barge pole. Being a barge and it's narrated by one of those men who had a very clipped voice and talked like this, and was really rather patronising. Then they heard that strong girls were wanted for a man-sized job, and now there's nothing you can tell them about what makes a barge go. And his attitude to the boaters is quite patronising too, you know, bargees, it's all hard, hard tech, hard life being a bargee. And of course they weren't bargees, they were boatmen. Uh, even the bargees weren't bargees, they were called lightermen. But it's almost as though you, there was no need to bother with the detail of being accurate. It'll be a queer thing when grandchildren ask Granny, what did you do in the war? And they say, I was a bargee. One of the interesting things about the trainees and their stories is they're actually quite a small group. But they were mostly middle class and four of them wrote books, others wrote diaries. But of course, there were other women working on boats, the boat families, who, who'd been born and bred to it. 
they were struggling by the Second World War, but nevertheless, there were still a lot of families, uh, the, the Skinners, the Littlemores, the Humphreys, the Coles. The Wallingtons and the Hambridges, the Lowes and the Tollies, the Prestons and the Buns, who rarely marry outside their own community and whose children are born and bred on the boats in a cabin a few feet square. They didn't go to school, they didn't learn to read or write. If Sheila Stewart hadn't, in the late 70s, early 80s, interviewed and recorded lots of them, without that, we would have no social history of the boats at all. Because, yeah, working class women tend to disappear out of sight. The boats are their homes. They're often on the move, summer and winter, in good weather and bad, for three or four weeks at a time. It is hard on the mothers and harder still on their children. When I moved onto a boat in 1999, my neighbours on the land were an elderly couple, Jack and Rose Skinner, and they came from the long line of number ones, the families who owned and operated their own boats, although they had moved off the boat uh, back in the 60s. But they'd both been born on the boats, grew up on them, married, and had their, had their family of four. And Rose told me lots of stories about when we was boating, but it included stories about the trainees because she was about 18 at the time. Did you always wear trousers? Not always, but they're warm and practical and most of the girls wear them. I'd love to wear trousers. I mean, I reckon Dad would kill me. He thinks you trainees ain't ladyfied wearing trousers. They had a tremendous social impact on the world of the boaters because it was very, it was very reserved. They, they accepted not really being able to read or write. They kept their heads down. Authority was something you didn't do too much with. And along came these young women who wore trousers and smoked and challenged authority. And that must have been a bit of an eye opener to an 18 year old like Rose Skinner. Because there wasn't the same kind of social mobility. There wasn't lots of gritty television drama to watch to give you some idea of what this other person's world was like. And for the girls coming in, I suppose it wasn't just the working boaters, it was all the, the, the men who worked in the docks. They, it must have, to both sides, it must have felt extraordinary. I don't remember learning how to work a lock. On the boats, it's, it's brilliant, yeah. Early in the morning, a horse on the path, the ring of shoes on cobblestones, the swish of a bow, a shout, the whip of a line, the soft flap as it drops on the cabin top, another whip, another shout, lock gate thud, rattle of paddle. Through cabin doors, nudged ajar, we stir to grey outlines on a slack black star stippled sky. Locks are nothing more than liquid lifts or stairs for barges. The barge sinks with the water level as the lock empties and rises as the lock fills. A little slow perhaps, but it does give the bargee time to get everything off his chest. Ready to handle lock gate and coal, windless and tiller, pound their muscles, ready to handle 
Ready to push, ready to pull, ready to jump, ready to steer, motor or butty boat, run on the top planks, grip the handrail, perch on the gunnel, lift the paddles, drop the paddles, bash their bodies, boat till they drop. That's one of those things. <laughs> uh, you know, for the, um, for the locks on the canal. My windlass is quite old. I've had it for 49 years. Uh, made of phosphor bronze. Not many of them were made of phosphor bronze. And if one lock was insufficient, they gave the boats a staircase to pass. If they came to a river, they went over it. They couldn't go round the hill, they went through it. Boating means a lot to me, the canals mean a lot to me. So I like writing stories um, about people, boats, you know, bridges. People called it a stinking ditch. Or they said, oh, you know, people fall in there. People would fall in there. We have to block it off. Neglect led to dereliction and often to abandonment. When I was a child, myself and my brother, we were ill a lot. And so mum took us to the doctors and the doctor said they need more fresh air and exercise. So dad bought us a boat, a 70 foot ex-working boat, an FMC boat, which was part sunk. We, uh, we got it up and my dad put a cabin on where the hold was. Practically anything discarded as useless, like these barges for example, can be transformed into something practical as well as eye-catching. At the time that I was growing up, the old working boats were actually, they'd been chucked away. Oh, I don't need those anymore. And gradually, people like my dad were buying them up and doing them up. And bravo to them, I say. <laughs> it's the first ever canal rally, and the narrow boats are there in all their painted glory. Some narrow boats are privately owned and make ideal homes. Dr. and Mrs. Dickinson have spent nearly £2,000 on converting theirs. To get the canals back to full use is the object of this unique rally. When we started, uh, the, it was the resurgence of the canals. People were starting to realise what an asset they were. But there was a lot of hard work needed and, and actually a lot of persuasion of authorities that it would be a good idea to open up this stretch. But now the canals are, are open. It's a leisure industry. And there's a nostalgia about the old working boats. So if, if People go to boat festivals specifically to go and see the old working boats. Army boats of beauty on 70 feet, straight as an arrow, painted so neat, a name on the side, cratch a bright red, roses and castles all round me head. So the women would have carried 50 tonnes of cargo across two boats. We managed a bag of coal and a bale of straw. Hmm. We took the bale of straw from Perivale, uh, Horsenden Farm, up to Southall. In exchange for a box of eggs, I seem right. to remember. Yes, because we were delivering that bale of straw to Emma and Mike, who run the onion barge. And they do veg boxes and, uh, and organic things and deliver those through London. And. There are women running all sorts of businesses on boats now. There's, there's the book boat, there's uh, the, the jam butty, selling homemade preserves, there's a cheese boat, an oat cake so boat. stronger than the Black Mama, yeah. but you will it's an exceedingly good cheese. That's what we know. So where, once upon a time, it might be a, a family with, with coal, now it's much, much broader and wider. And, you have all sorts of things that women are, are trading in, but also other kinds of things. So us, with our cargo of stories. Break the ice off in chunks. And work it back out of the lock. He said, I wondered what the Dickens he said it was, he said. What are you two wenches, he said, doing? Well, he sounds a bit uncertain, but I expect I would, hearing I was on my way to Berlin with 50 tonnes of steel. It has grown tremendously in the last few years. Yeah. And I think it's great that it brings a different kind of women at work on the waterways. If we were starting from scratch now, perhaps we could build the canals differently. But it's no good thinking of them in those terms. The 
this, and they're worth something as they stand.